my research is on the, the role of social institutions in constructing women's sexuality and morality. And I'm, I'm giving a feminist analysis of marriage and the family in Uganda, which are very highly respected institutions, social institutions in the country. My, my current work is over 100 pages long. So for today's discussion, I'll only highlight a few issues that are, I think are important for women's sexuality in Uganda. Now, a question has frequently been posed to me. Why sexuality? So what about sexuality? And of course, to many, sexuality seems like a relatively obvious and certainly private matter to be left to the individuals concerned. However, in Uganda, which is my country of study, sexuality is a very timely issue for research and one that has implications for gender equality and women's rights generally. I also chose to research on sexuality because it doesn't touch on only one category or subcategory of women, say disabled or re, re, you know, refugees, but it touches upon all women. So it was a good indicator for women's empowerment generally. Now, there have been recent occurrences in Uganda that spotlight the aspect of sexuality. This includes the ratification of the Maputo Protocol. This is the additional protocol to the African Charter on Women's Rights. And this is the key regional instrument on sexuality. Uh, although Uganda made reservations on Article 14, which um, curtail uh, women's rights to control reproduction. In Uganda to date, there are also ongoing consultations on the marriage bill. This is a law that proposes to reform marriage and the family in Uganda. And there are also heated debates, as you may know, about a proposed anti-homosexuality law. So as an African feminist, I seize this opportunity to investigate how all this interplays with gender equity and equality. I'd like to flag out a recent incident that happened about a week or so in Uganda. Um, National TV covered about one or two minutes of the arrest of a famous uh, female opposition leader uh, called Ingrid Turinawe. For about three minutes, because she had resisted coming out of her vehicle, she was going for a protest rally. The policemen pressed, they squeezed her breasts, and this was covered on national TV. So um, human rights activists are going on about the way she was arrested and you know, making a, a lot of noise about it. But for me, it's not only about you know, her human rights. Uh, actually, for me, it brings it really down to issues of bodily integrity and autonomy, her sexual rights and you know, her sexuality. Gross violations of women's rights not only touch upon issues of just their human rights, but they go down to their sexuality. And that's why, you know, sexuality, the research on sexuality really makes uh, meaning for me. Um, of course, um, the fact that she was not married is important to me. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if someone made a comment, well, it's not too bad. After all, she wasn't married. So for me, I would ask the question, is it because she does not belong to a man as you know, is required by society that her sexuality can be abused by any other man by, that sanctions the policeman, you know, to give her the right, to give him the right to, to touch her body. So I thus interrogate how the norms and morals of sexuality expected of women are defined through marriage and the family, which are very highly respected social institutions. My research gives a feminist focus on a group of empowered um, elite women, just like Ingrid here. She would make a very interesting respondent for me when I do my field work. And I examine the extent to which family and marriage have impacted on the construction and enjoyment of their sexual rights and sexuality. Um, my work takes the following outline. I'll look at an introduction to the concept of sexuality, sexual rights, power, and the role of feminism give it a lot of theoretical background, and then I'll, uh, I'll undertake some consideration of some of the key sexuality dimensions in Uganda, and then engage in a discussion on the construction of sexuality within the family and marriage, looking at the law, looking at the practice. My next step would be to do field work, to document and analyze voices, what I've called her stories. We've always listened to his stories. So this time I want to look at her stories on elite women's sexuality as an indicator on what other women's sexuality really is like. And then 
uh, possibly uh, do an interrogation of the vulnerability conversation as a way of identifying means to fortify women's sexuality in Uganda and then end by giving some uh, relevant conclusions and recommendations. So beginning, what is sexuality? As the core of my research, I begin by formulating an appreciation of sexuality as applicable within the Ugandan context, and I take from written jurisprudence, which highlights that sexuality includes personal feelings, sexual behavior, as well as biological and physical attributes of being either male or female. Related to this is aspect of sexual rights, and although this is a, a fairly novel part of rights, I think it's, um, and well, not greatly expounded on, I think it's important to forge a link between this and sexuality because it makes sexuality more visible and legally enforceable. Now, in terms of the local context in Uganda with regard to respect for women's sexuality and their sexual rights, um, it's fairly positive. There has been the adoption of a constitution which is largely regarded as gender sensitive. It prohibits laws, customs, cultures that work against the dignity and welfare of women. In terms of the, the legal framework, there's also been the enactment of a gender policy. There have been enactment of laws against female genital cutting, uh, domestic violence, trafficking in persons. So you could say that in terms of uh, the, the legal regime, Uganda is fairly well covered. Of course, there are challenges that remain with regard to enforcing the laws and uh, respecting rights. Uh, and of course, um, uh, other ch factors that uh, affect women's sexuality include poverty, the, the feminized poverty that uh, is mainly felt by women, ignorance of the law and the rights, especially by women, high fertility rate, early marriage, negative cultural practices, and a prevalence in polygamy. And these are aspects that I note in my work. Now, patriarchy and... Um, you know, all these challenges occur within the realm of patriarchy, which is dominant in Uganda. And in here, men enforce norms of discipline to gain social control over women's body. What does patriarchy do? It creates a public-private divide and encourages to women to keep in the latter. So you find that there are lower numbers of women in the public spaces, in, in politics, in education, uh, in the judiciary. The belief that women are only as good as cooks, carers, and natural, naturals is alive and well in Uganda. In fact, those women like Ingrid that I, I talked about earlier that managed to break the barriers and make a career for themselves in the public sphere face huge societal backlash to the extent of being perceived as not female enough or even marriageable material. So you see that there is something, uh, you know, there's a connection between marriage, the family and women's sexuality and the fact that you know you're breaking the barrier between the private and the public so the power of patriarchy classifies sexuality generally into good and bad moral and immoral or acceptable and illicit it permits male dominance over women resulting into a restraint and subordination of their sexuality at such a point for me, feminism is crucial because it comes to seek the empowerment of women and the transformation of traditionally male-dominated institutions such as the marriage, as marriage and the family, which I'm, I'm, I'm considering in my research. So I use a feminist analysis to challenge uh, what is the perceived neutrality or objectivity of the laws and customs that we take for granted in Uganda. So I focus on um, key dimensions of sexuality. And I would like to um, just briefly discuss this. Um, one is to do with the formation of, of satisfactory intimate relationships. I point out in my work the difficulties faced by women in this regard. Um, since culture and tradition largely disallow women from freely choosing their sexual partners, and I give such several cases to illustrate this. Girls cannot choose their partners. Parents have to come in and approve. Or, and there are a number of cases that uh, I, I'll illustrate this. Um, and then I, I touch upon the issue of sexual identity and ori orientation, which is a very touchy matter right now in Uganda. 
By criminalizing same-sex relationships, heterosexuality has saliently maintained itself as the privileged and only acceptable norm of enjoying sexual relations. And this is a position that has been reinforced in the Constitution by an amendment that specifically prohibits same-sex marriage. Resultantly, homosexual people, including women, currently live in a very hostile environment. And although there have been attempts to remedy this situation in the courts of law, and even if these attempts, there have been two cases, one in 2008 and another in 2010. Uh, briefly, the case in 2008, uh, there was um, an illegal search, entry and search of the residence of two women. And uh, they took the matter to court saying that there'd been a violation of their privacy. And the court did agree with them, but the court failed to make a connection between their sexual orientation, the right to privacy, and the violation that had, had occurred. The 2010 case, uh, one of the newspapers in Uganda published the names of um, suspected homosexual persons. So the courts, although they, uh, they, they, these particular cases were successful, they failed to demonstrate, uh, to bestow rights upon this particular group of people. And although they, they used the, an application of international human rights law, they failed to make a direct connection between the violations that occurred and the gender identity of the applicants. They just extended the right generally to them as, as human beings. Now, in terms of reproductive choice, that's, that also uh, presents one of the most daunting environment for women's sexuality. There is a high social value placed on reproduction, a matter that is historically viewed as a key component of women's duties and therefore non-negotiable. The law prohibits the right to terminate the life of an unborn child and further fails to recognize rape and incest as grounds upon which an induced abortion is justified. Um, which is the reservation that we talked about uh, in the Maputo that Uganda actually just made in 2010. Unfortunately, the country suffers devastating maternal mortality rates. It's the highest cause of, of um, um, and one, uh, abortion is the highest cause of, of maternal mortality as women attempt to end unwanted pregnancies. Another matter that I highlight in my work is to do with uh, marital rape or non consensual spousal rape. This originates from the fact that marriage is traditionally viewed as an instrument of gender power. It gives a husband the right and power to control marital intercourse and in Uganda the practice of marital rape is legal, widely tolerated and accepted as a husband's prerogative. And actually many women, many of whom are married at very early ages, are totally dependent on their husbands, are poorly educated, have no option but to stay in marriages and submit to their husband's wishes, a situation that leaves them with very little sexual autonomy. HIV AIDS adds a further layer of complexities to female sexuality. Its effects are worst felt on women. Currently in Uganda, HIV prevalence is estimated at 7.7% for women in comparison to 5.6% for men. And the low cultural, social, and economic status of women remains the key driver behind the female face of the HIV AIDS pandemic. If we can move on to female genital cutting or mutilation, that's another mechanism used for the social control of, of women's sexuality. The procedure in its varied forms ensures premarital virginity and marital sexual restraint. And although the statistics on this are very hard to come by because it's done in private and you know not very well reported, um, at least the effects on the victims are easy to see because the victims are so traumatized, they can only associate their genitals with pain and possible death from childbirth. I further point out the issue of sexual and gender-based violence or violence against women, um, which is mainly experienced in the private setting and, of course, you know, by uh, intimate partners. And national statistics reveal that 70% of women 15 to 49 years of age have been physically and sexually abused. Sexual and gender-based violence keeps maternal mortality and fertility rates high. It increases the likelihood that sex will not be safe, voluntary or pleasurable. As such, it is a key issue that hampers women's full enjoyment of their sexuality. And lastly, I touch upon the two issues of prostitution, or you would call it commercial sex and pornography. 
which I call the two Ps, and their relationship to women's sexuality in Uganda. This spur much debate among feminists in and outside of, of, of Uganda with regard to their real value for gender equality. In some cases, they are rejected on grounds that they are an expression of men's power over women. But other feminists find them to be a potential avenue for women's sexual openness and assertiveness. So there are two positions with regard to this. However, that said, the two practices continue to thrive in Uganda, although they are legally restricted. And the core moral argument for this criminal prohib prohibition rests on a cultural premise that extends male rights of ownership over female bodies. For women to use their bodies as they please with multi multiple partners uh, for commercial sex or for multiple viewing through pornography falls way out of the established patriarchal norms. Nevertheless, whereas there might be some value in arguing for women's right to choose and free expression through the, the two Ps, I take note of the fact that the majority of women in Uganda who engage in this, those seemingly willing participants are from a poor and low social cultural background with few other options for survival. I therefore caution that a balance be made regarding these women's right to enjoy their sexuality and free choice, while at the same time ensuring their protection from abuse and degradation. Um, I then focus on the actual law and practice on highlighted issues related to sexuality in marriage and the family. Um, of course, marriage and the family are ideally very private institutions, but they are in fact very much in the public sphere and very heavily regulated and controlled by the law, which is what this particular section does. Um, the law defines the rights and privileges of marriage, the agreed norms, as well as the consequences of non-conformity. And in this section, I show how law and custom perform the work of inscribing sexuality in society by considering five things. I look at contraction of marriage, rights in marriage, roles in marriage, wealth transmission and property rights, and then I look at dissolution of marriage, which are really the key components of, of family law or marriage law, if you can call it that. Under contraction of marriage, I consider two things, parties to a marriage as well as bride wealth. Um, the law interplays with sexuality when it de determines who may marry. Only those that meet the moral high grounds defined as right by the society are privileged to contract marriage. So according to this, sexuality that is normal and natural should ideally be heterosexual, marital, monogamous, reproductive, and non-commercial. Bride wealth, on the other hand, is an important part of contracting a marriage under customary law in Uganda, although it has questionable implications on women's sexuality. Uh, to note, the discussions to what extent um, to determine how much what is given for bride wealth and how the payments will be made prior to the conclusion of a marriage involve majorly the men and disregard the opinion of the bride. The result of this process is that a woman is bought into the man's household and for me, that's a way of perpetuating the unequal power relations within the sexual equation in the marriage. With regard to rights in marriage, the institution of marriage involves a complex set of behavioral expectations that defines the rights of, institution, of, of, of spouses. And one right that I consider is the right to equality in marriage. Whereas equality is guaranteed by the Constitution of Uganda. The practice of polygamy, or you can call it polygyny, exists and is recognized by law. It's protected by law. And I argue in my work that this recognition under the law waters down the right to equality in marriage. Recent national statistics show, note that 28% of married women in Uganda are in polygamous unions. This, for me, has negative implications when translated to the individual sexual lives of women. For one, polygamy decreases the age of first marriage, while at the same time pushing up the birth rate as women in the polygamous union compete in the number of children that they have. Um, and I believe that the more children they bear, the higher their social status in the marital home. 
This increases their exposition to the pregnancy risk and limits their ability to have free choice in the number of children that they want. At the same time, of course, they have to share their husband amongst themselves, one or two or three, you know, maybe following a schedule or a timetable of sorts. And of course, this leaves them less time, you know, to, to share their partners. So for me, the factor of polygyny therefore sanctions women's subordination and negates to some extent the full enjoyment of their sexuality. Moving on to another right, the right to equality before the law, I consider the issue of the law on adultery. Um, under the law of adultery, the law places different standards of sexual morality for men and women. Um, and it is a criminal offense for a married man in Uganda to have sexual relations, but only with another married woman. If he has sexual relations while married, but with, with a non-married woman, that does not amount to adultery. While on the other hand, a married woman having sexual relations, whether involving married or non-married married partners, amounts to adultery. This definition by itself effectively approves married men to have sexual intercourse with any woman, provided they are not married, but it restricts the same for women. And the effect of this legal stipulation is the imposition of double standards on sexual norms based on sex. It glorifies male sexuality and choice while subduing that of their female counter counterparts. Consequently, these inequalities certify subordination of women in the institutions of marriage and family because they endorse male sexual promiscuity but impose stricter control over women's sexuality. I then move on to the law of prostitution, which I think is another good illustration of the unequal treatment of men and women under the law. The penal code targets sellers of sex who are most likely to be women, at least in Uganda, while the clients who procure the services, the men walk away scot-free. In actual sense, this provision restrains the sexual activities of women by limiting the number of partners and mode through which they can engage sexually, but no, does nothing similar with regard to the male counterparts. From the above, it is evident that the law sanctions a multi-partner sexuality for men, giving them the leeway to experiment with the sexuality of several other women outside of marriage, while it concurrently makes women the sole property of their husbands. The law promotes male sexual opportunities, but limits those of the females and instead confines them to marriage and the family. Another aspect that I explore is that of gender roles in marriage. Historically, the family has been the most explicitly gendered institution, and law and custom have been used to dictate distinct and well-defined roles. Perhaps the most gendered role and, and one that uh, I, is regarded as a key function in marriage is reproduction. In Uganda, the choice of motherhood is still unquestioned. Becoming a mother is seen as essential to being recognized as a real woman, and the high fertility rates, uh, currently at 6.7 children per woman, are evidence of the high regard for childbearing. The inability to have children, locally referred to as barrenness, is highly despised and actually blamed on women, at least um, you know, locally. Um, further, related to the legal mandate for women to carry the fetus and give birth to the baby is the assumed role of nursing and nurturing it through infancy. That is the role of child care. Notably in Uganda, the maternity period is 60 days, uh, three months, as compared to the four working days for paternal leave that are given to men. This, in essence, forces child care upon women because it assumes that women should give up a substantial amount of time from work after the birth of a child to look after it. At the same time, paternal leave can only be enjoyed within a marriage setting by married men. So that, and that does not cover, you know, non-married men, married men having babies with, uh, you know, other women or polygamous settings. Because if you have four wives, how many times are you going to take paternal leave if all the four wives are actually having babies in one, in one year? So the meaning of this is that all women get obligatory days to stay at home and nurture children, while the fathers of the children may get none at all. 
I also consider wealth transmission and property rights uh, as having remarkable implications for women's sexuality, custom and tradition according to a husband, authority over his wife, including her physical body, labor and property. Specifically, the patrilineal customary system generally disallows women from owning or even inheriting property, including land, which in Uganda is the key asset that can be possessed by any person. So the gender structure of property ownership, which is tipped in favor of the men, implies less power, less economic might, and therefore less bargaining ground for women who are more disadvantaged, even in aspects touching on their sexuality. With regard to succession and inheritance, also related to property rights, both custom and statutory law are distinctly discriminatory against women. They prefer males to females without reasonable and objective criteria. For example, a widow's right to access the home, to remain in the home after the passing of her husband, depends on whether she remarries or not. If she does remarry, she loses, it's an automatic, she loses the right to stay in, in, in the marital home. And yet this does not apply equivalently to men. So you can see that there, there are still implications with regard to property rights and, and women's sexuality and, and the right to, to, to autonomy generally. Uh, lastly, the issue of um, dissolution of marriage is uh, another thing that I considered, which I think has uh, implications on gender and sexuality generally. Under customary law, dissolution of marriage is concluded through the return of bride price, but this is often impossible as the property may no longer be there. Uh, if a, a girl gets married five years down the road, she wants to leave the husband, the family has to return the property that was given to them, and yet this property, maybe had 10 heads of cattle has been used by her brothers to marry wives for themselves. So this property is no longer there, and there's no way the family is going to sanction her living because you know, there's no way that they're going to get back this property. So this keeps women in marriages involuntarily. Further, the law relies on fault as a basis for termination of marriage. This is particularly detrimental to women since uh, divorce attracts lengthy and hostile legal proceedings. There are high prohibitive fees involved. Um, if, uh, say, for example, a case of adultery or proving cruelty or desertion. Uh, it, it definitely requires a lot of technical know-how for women, and the unfamiliar judicial and court processes are work definitely against women. So a large percentage of women, many of whom are unemployed, illiterate, and socially disadvantaged, just cannot afford to navigate these legal processes or even to deal with the social repercussions arising from it. Now, in terms of the customary practices that follow suit on dissolution of a marriage, widow cleansing, this is upon death, widow cleansing or inheritance. Um, I, I, it, I cannot complete you know, dissolution of marriage without touching upon these issues. They are practiced under customary law uh, for one, widow cleansing is rooted in the belief that a woman is haunted by her husband's spirit after his death. And this ritual gives a nod to a man from her husband's family, usually a brother, to have sexual relations with her in order to cleanse her of her misfortune. In many instances, a widow must undergo the ritual before she can be inherited. Related to this is the aspect of uh, widow inheritance, which is a type of marriage, uh, where a widow marries a kinsman of her late husband, often his brother. These two practices, although you know, decreasing, still happen in the rural areas, and they reinforce male-dominated power over women's sexuality because they leave women with little choice in whom to have sexual relations with or even to partner with. I conclude my current work with a critical examination of the marriage bill, uh, which is being debated right now. The legislation proposes to consolidate and reform laws on marriage and the family, and it makes some, it proposes some new changes, which I believe have uh, implications to women's sexuality. One, it puts the age of marriage at 18. That's important because it addresses the issue of early marriage, girls getting married before, you know, at an early age. Secondly, it outlaws widow inheritance, 
prohibits forced marriages, and it makes bride price non-refundable. Then it creates both criminal and civil sanctions for spouses who force their partners into sex when there are no reasonable grounds for this denial, such as, uh, as poor health. So this would deal with the issue of uh, marital rape and also coming to, to help with HIV AIDS uh, in marriages where women try to protect themselves on suspect, suspicion that their partners may be infected. Then the bill also recognizes both mat matrimonial as well as separate property. That's been an issue that I touch upon in my research, but I didn't uh, flag here, where all matri matrimonial, mat or mat mat matrimonial property is regarded as, uh, as belonging to the husband. So it takes into consideration spouses who may not make a direct financial contribution and say that they still have an interest in the property. It also recognizes cohabitation as a legal union uh, currently, cohabitation is, is not a legally recognized union in Uganda, and it permits cohabiting couples to, defi to divide the wealth accumulated while uh, staying together. It also introduces the standard of irretrieval breakdown of marriage as the sole ground for dissolution of marriage. So it, deals, it deals, does away with the, the fault, so that making it easier for women to, to live uh, unhappy marriages. Nevertheless, the bill in its optimism is also ridden with challenges to note. It retains the heteronormative characterization of marriage as that between a man and a woman, and it thus fails to recognize the new family structures that are taking shape in Uganda and elsewhere in the world. We have a lot of single families, child-headed families because of the HIV, and there are still problems about recognizing this as, as families within the law. Further yet, the bill recognizes customary marriages as polygamous, although it does not set any requirements for a person intending to marry any subsequent wife. So they, there are still problems with the bill. And I hope that my work, if it's in time, would be able to uh, positively uh, impact on the, the, final, the final draft of the law. However, I, I still believe that the content of the bill, as it is, will go a long way in addressing some of the issues concerning women's rights and sexuality, because it provides some legal operationalization of the rights in the Constitution. The Constitution, as I mentioned at the beginning, says laws and customs are prohibited, but without an actual law that you know, specifies this, it's, it's hard to enforce. So in a way, it will do a lot to promote gender equality and, and women's power to enjoy their sexuality. Um, I end my work. Currently, it's still work in progress, but for now, uh, th there are some quick conclusions that uh, can be made. One is that marriage and the family are at the core of sexual activity, and it is within these institutions that the award of sexual rights is legitimized. Without marriage, without family, all sex is illicit, it's um, improper. That has a lot of say for women's rights and, 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 and their sexuality generally. Secondly, the sanctity of marriage and the family enforces norms and standards of sexual morality through culture and law. And any attempt to enjoy sexuality outside of these institutions makes one a social deviant. As I mentioned at the beginning, Ingrid Turinawe, the, the female opposition leader, was not married. So people would have probably said, well, she called it upon herself. After all, she's not, you know, so it still matters what uh, marital status uh, women do have. Number three, the majority of laws and customs are discriminatory as, as are portrayed and are largely used to put reins on women's sexuality and they generally work towards the, their general subordination. And fourthly, the combined effect of these laws constructs, in my view, a dominant male gender with the power to enjoy varied sexualities within the family sphere, while creating a normative version of female sexuality that is monogamous, heterosexual, passive, if you'd call it that, and powerless, which reflects on the vulnerable nature of women makes women to seem vulnerable and require regulation and protection, um, thereby defining and constructing women's sexuality in a certain way. So as I continue to research and analyze pertinent aspects of women's sexuality in Uganda, my next step after here is to undertake field work in Uganda. I hope to find and highlight through field work some success stories, what I call her stories, where powerful women, where elite women such as Ingrid Turinawe will 
uh, share with me their stories about the cost of, you know, the family and, and society, marriage, what is it, not, what's the cost of not being married, how has it affected their sexuality, what does it mean to be in the public sphere, what have they had to give up, uh, how are they defining or redefining or reconstructing their sexuality. And I hope to document and voice these stories um, and to see what options are available to them. I also want to examine to what extent marriage and family are still relevant, you know, socially relevant in the context of Uganda. So that's where I've reached at this point. Thank you for listening to me. That was so interesting. Thank you so much. Thank I had you. two questions, both relating to the question of choice, which I think is key to this issue of sexual autonomy. Um, the first was you talked about the bride price and other pieces of the marriage arrangement, but not so much about marriage choice. And I was wondering if you could describe a little what role a, a woman has in cho choosing her marriage partner in Uganda, um, and, and what role the family has in that bride price um, plays in, in limiting or um, whether there's a choice there at all. Um, and then secondly, you talked about prostitution as being a, an area that may embody women's choice, but I wonder if it isn't still driven by men's choice because it's dependent on which men choose to pay. Um, and it also is another form, I think, of encouraging female dependence on men financially. And so I just wonder if you could explore that a little bit. To, to what degree is there actual choice in, in that prostitution arrangement? Okay. Um, regarding the first one, the role of women in, in, in choice, at the beginning I mentioned that uh, culture and tradition generally disallow women from choosing their partners. It's mainly the family that is going to identify a partner and, and negotiate. Of course, uh, it, that's why um, I'd like to look at what I call the elite women, the ones who've come out of the rural area who are more enlightened, to what extent does this still affect them? Has it also been their families that have you know, identified for them partners? But there are several cases, there are two cases that I highlight in my research. Uh, one is uh, Bruno Serunkuma. In this case, a girl chose a partner and they went through a, a process of marriage and then the, fam the father actually challenged her marriage saying that she, she didn't get the approval and the, the, her partner was from the, her same clan so the, it was an abomination for them to get married. So the, the court actually agreed with the father and annulled the marriage. So in terms of girls' choice to choose partners, there, there are still problems with that and there are two cases that I, I give. Um, in terms of choice regarding prostitution, yes, the, the market is definitely still controlled by men. But when you talk to uh, commercial sex workers in Uganda, they say, give us the choice because we don't have much option anyway. So if we want to use this avenue to take our, to, you know, get our children through school, let this be a choice. Uh, allow us to, to, you know, to get the health options to be able to access uh, contraceptives and ETC. So, as much as the market is still controlled by men, and, and actually the, 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 the commercial sex workers are fairly organized, a fairly organized group. They want a representative in the parliament um, you know, to speak on their behalf. They have very vibrant organizations representing them, and they say, this is our choice. Actually, when we talk to them, um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm part of um, some female activists in Uganda. They tell us, well, at least we get to choose who we sleep with, and you know, and they pay us for it. But you married women don't even get to choose, you know, and you do it for nothing. So they, they feel fairly empowered. They feel that they do have the choice, yeah. But, well, you can't say that all of them do have the choice. For, for some, it's really just an option for survival. Um, could you say a little bit about um, the role of customary, the continued influence of customary law and uh, culture, and um, also the role of religion uh, in, in, in shaping these law reforms? I mean, what, what role is there there? And I was also wondering if, I, I know that there's been um, some uh, uh, invasion of the evangelicals in Uganda in regard to the homosexuality issue. Has that happened on these other issues of women's sexuality also, where they, they've kind of um, been generating a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, concern about homosexuality in Uganda that led to 
some some proposed suggestions for life imprisonment or even the death penalty. Is, is that happening with women's sexuality also? Okay, two two examples come to mind. We talk about you know the the continued influence of of customary law and culture. One is something which may be very trivial, but as feminists are very strong about, is the issue of taking on the husband's name. Culture and religion believe that when two people get married, they become one, and, and the, the one is the husband, as you know, the law recognizes that the one as the husband, at least we've had that in case law. And the women are saying, no, it should be the option of the woman to take on the husband's name. It shouldn't be compulsory. But culture, religion say, no, this is something that you know, should, should be, once you, you marry, you definitely take, take on the husband's name. It's something that uh, we have, has been left out of the, the marriage bill for now because it, it's, it's very contentious. The, the religious and cultural people are not very comfortable with that. Um, the other issue is, is uh, marital rape. Um, under the Domestic Violence Act, it could not be agreed by both uh, you know, the state, the, the religious bodies, on whether they could actually be married or rape in, in, in a family. They felt that, you know, once you get married as a woman, that is a yes to whatever happens in the marriage. And, and women felt that, no, there, there should be boundaries. So the, definitely culture, religion are still, you know, influencing the way that, that the law is, is shaping out. Um, the other thing was um, in the marriage bill, the Muslims also failed to agree on certain things, so they have chosen to come up with their own Muslim marriage law. So they have pulled it out of the marriage bill. And under this law, of course, they, they insist on having the polygyny, the polygamy, and um, uh, the, the proposal initially had been that the state should regulate polygamy, that in case one wanted to take another wife, he should be able to, pro to show proof that he can provide for them with at least an additional home, you know, separate homes for the two wives, and show that you have the economic standing to provide for two homes. And the Muslims have actually contested this. So you can actually see that, you know, the, the, the pulling out of this and having their own law is still uh, an influence of, of religion on, on law. Yes. yes. Questions about international human rights in the context of Uganda. Is Uganda a party to seat all? Yes, without reservation. And, and are there, are the, I assume there are NGOs in Uganda focused on the extent to which Uganda is living up to the ideals of CEDAW. Are, are those NGOs uh, vibrant institutions within Uganda? Are they, are, are they enjoying some success? They are fairly vibrant. In 2010, Uganda, um, submitted its periodic report to the CEDAW committee. And there were many comments. And then, of course, the, 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 in, the civil society organizations also gave a shadow report, which also showed a lot of the challenges that were still there, domestic violence, HIV AIDS, po polygamy, etc. They are, they are trying. But of course, because a lot of the rights are economic, social, the state argues that available resources and, and ETC. But yes, the, the, the NGOs are there. A reservation that Uganda entered when it became a party, if I understood you, maybe I didn't understand you, a party to the Protocol on Women mm. to the African Charter. Uh, was that a reservation to that, what I think by international standards is a rather extraordinary provision about abortion? Yes, it's Article 14 on the Maputo Protocol. The Uganda entered a reservation. Two, but I just want to be clear about this. A reservation to the provision that's to that, to yes, abortion. yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Mm. To women's right to control reproduction. But yeah, I mean, it's it's striking the uh, that this is, as far as I know, the only uh, regional or international human rights document that actually speaks specifically to the issue of abortion. Mm. Right. Mm. It's the key regional in instrument on 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 really on abortion. Mm. But Uganda entered a reservation on that. Um, I have a technical question about whether or not the reservation was only limited to abortion of, or whether or not it also applied to contraception. Because um, in part, I was 
thinking through um, your discussion of the fertility rates and how it both reflects a high social and legal regard for childbearing, but I'm also wondering about other institutional conditions behind that, about access to contraception in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and you also outlined some other questions about the ability to say no to sex within uh, the marriage framework. Um, and I'm very interested in um, your, the, the way you're going to frame your ethnographic field, field work. And so can you tell us a little bit more about um, who are the populations you're thinking about interviewing? Um, how are you categorizing elite here? And because I'm particularly interested in, um, in how you'll be looking at how these women engage with the law but, and their knowledge of the law, but also social practices that they engage with that might overtly be contesting the structure of law. Um, or circumvented in other forms. Okay. Um, Uganda entered a reservation on Article 14, subs Article 1, A and C. A is with, with, with regard to non-termination of pregnancies, um, even under, whether it be for incest or even rape. Um, so that, that is to do with the termination of, of pregnancy. And then uh, the part on C, if read well, I think captures the issue of the morning after pill. As it also limits the, the con contraceptives that women can actually take, the way it, it's defined. So you, you can't take or you can't come in to terminate a pregnancy that has already started on, on its way. So the, there are also issues to do with the, the contraceptives. Um, in regard Sorry? Defining pregnancy as a fertilized egg. I'm wondering, I'm, I'm wondering just on, on a technical level what, what practices and what methods are permitted. Yeah, if, if, you, read, if you read strictly uh, Article 14C, it, it means that even the morning after pill would actually be uh, an offense. Yeah. But I don't know to what extent that, that an egg has been fertilized the morning after. Yeah. But of course, it's hard to enforce such such laws, yeah. Uh, now, in terms of the field work, I'm looking at interviewing, maybe my initial proposal was to look at 35 to 60 women. Um, I would like to share with them the, their what I've called personal lived experiences of their sexuality. Um, these elite or powerful women, I intend to pull from different spheres in the public who are already you know, fairly vibrant in the public, in politics, economically, the judiciary, etc. Uh, because there's been a lot of, of silence on, on issues of sexuality. I've, I mean, there are a number of, of women that I've already consulted. Uh, for me, it's women who are vocal on, on issues of women's sexuality. I'm looking at human rights activists. Uh, women that have really b been fighting for rights of other women, women that are not scared to come out on behalf of, of other women, and also women that have made it in terms of like financial uh, standing. So how have they been able to move from the private sphere to the public, and at what cost? What, cost has, what has this cost them in terms of their sexuality? Are they marriageable enough as, as, as it is? I'm still looking, looking for ways to, you know, to find them, but I, I, I think there are quite a number of, of them. Yeah. Mm. Do I answer your question? <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, the NRM government, uh, the current reigning government, boasts about empowering women. So we do have a lot of supposedly empowered women, you know, but how many of them are actually that empowered? How many feel powerful enough, you know, to negotiate safe sex and things like that, yeah. So those are the kind of women that I would like to interview because I think it's a good indicator for what other women who are lower on the grassroots would, would, would actually do. If I interviewed Ingrid Turinawe, the, the female opposition leader, the fact that the police can actually squeeze her breasts on, on national TV would actually show that if it was another woman, they would probably do worse than, than they did to this one. It may not be easy, I know, because sharing one's sexuality is something that's quite intimate. But I hope to, to be able to maneuver around it. Mm. To the uh, policeman who was involved in this episode. Well, they've called for his resignation. Um, 
the problem is that people don't know who this policeman was. The police made a statement that the man has been uh, asked to resign, but we don't know whether that's true because the person is not even known. So, but the police has been under a lot of fire for so many uh, violations. Thank you so much there.